When the world makes no sense, a sound philosophical foundation can help bring everything into perspective. Fortunately, Western society has a rich tradition of great philosophers whose ideas provide a guide for navigating life's toughest questions and establishing sound principles for a meaningful existence. Philosophy for the People with host Pat Flynn offers a straightforward conversation about these insights and how they can help you understand the modern era. Help Pat help you as he breaks down our greatest philosophical traditions so that you can think logically about our world and apply the moral clarity you need to create a richer, more fulfilling life. Morning, Dr. Jim. Good morning, Pat. How you doing, man? Good. We switched sides. You're on the you're on the left side now. I'm on the right. How did that happen? I don't what know, man. Is this, it's is freaking, this a coup? It's, it's freaking me out on Freaky Friday here. Yeah, right. So welcome everybody to Freaky Friday. This is uh, an, an unusual time for our uh, Friday stream, so we'll see who shows up. Uh, but for anybody who tunes in, we will gladly answer whatever questions you send our way after we get properly warmed up here with a little, Righto. little, uh, little, I guess, morning greetings. What are you reading this morning? What are you working on? I uh, like yesterday. I just finished. I, I just slammed through a couple of papers that I was just like enchanted by by a guy named Graham Harmon who's one of the object oriented ontology dudes and um this morning I was reading uh one of Carl Jung's essays on synchronicity mm. so yeah so I've, I've been uh I've been in the weird yeah uh Harmon dude that's know, funny the, man somebody so yeah. I gave this talk in Tulsa and somebody actually had a question about synchronicity which actually makes the point about synchronicity so, <laughs> yeah right like but about Jung's notion of it Mm -hmm. yeah what um, his i think his related more to notions of coincidence and yeah. and uh ultimately providence um yeah. but it was it was it was interesting so for people who don't know I, I gave a talk in tulsa recently which is now available online and i think the q a part was i haven't reviewed the video but i think it's in there so i don't remember exactly it was it was a it was a viciously quick trip uh, and everything's yes, the haze. Yeah. Right, you know, right. you know how those go where it's oh, like, I know. Yeah, you I know. fly in, you do the talk, you yeah. fly back out. It's just yeah, a exactly, mess. So right. it was one of those. Play the hits, man. Play the hits. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, okay. So, so Jung, um, and you know, and he's writing, uh, his stuff on synchronicity in the early 1950s. So, you know, there could have been all order of, of, you know, research that has gone the other way. But my understanding, like reading people like Rupert Sheldrake, who, who's like really controversial, but still, uh, we'll say that like it, a lot of this stuff has been reaffirmed, reaffirmed, reaffirmed experimentally. But Jung thinks that um, what we think of as coincidences of say like like prescience, you know, where I dreamt something and then it turned out to happen, right, mm -hmm. um, is just it's too frequent in his clinical experience uh, to think that it's merely coincidental. Yeah. Like merely, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, and he he appeals to a lot of research that was done in his era about like ESP, where you know like you have uh, decks of cards, you know, with five suits, and you know you should you twenty five cards each five cards of each suit, you at best should do one in five guessing what the suit is, mm -hmm. and uh, experimentally, you know, it's been shown that humans beat the one in five on that. Mm. Okay, so it seems like okay, so like there's, you, it, there's more going on there, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, he 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 himself did some weird experimentation with. Um, uh, I, I love everything about that line. Somebody did weird experimentation. Exactly. <laughs> and we, I just imagine setting things up in my basement and doing some exactly. weird experiments of my own. Yeah, <laughs> on on astrology, and came out with you know some statistically significant results, right? And so for for Jung. He thinks that there has to be, he, he calls the subtitle to his book on synchronicity is called an a causal principle, right? So he thinks that in addition to like ordinary Newtonian level macro physical cause it, causation, there has to be this other kind of a causal process, which operates by, um, by meaning and not like, like physical causality. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of it. It's like my first Fourier into that kind of, um, 
you know, paranormal research sort of thing. Right. Uh, but I, but I do find what Young's up to very, very interesting there. Yeah. People, uh, I'm really fascinated, um, by this in a number of ways. First off, I just want to highlight, um, your posture towards this. I think it's cool, right? Like you go into something that's new and like, I don't know what to think about it. I just made a first pass. Right. And that goes yeah. back to one of the <laughs> <Yeah>. themes. <laughs> no, one of the themes that we talk yeah. about on in this channel, and this is something I get from Mortimer Adler. He's, he's insistent. He's like, before you say, I, I agree or disagree with something, you better be able to say, I understand. Right. And I think the honest thing for most of us, uh, when we kind of shift gears pretty dramatically is like, should we really think we, we should be in a position to disagree or disagree our first pass through something, right? Are we, are we yeah. that good at sort of, especially with somebody like young, right? He's not, he's not coming from like a, an analytic philosophical background, right? So there's always going to be yep. terms that he's using differently yep. language, uh, you know, uh, the way he develops and uses language is going to be very different that if you come yep. at it from a philosophical perspective, you're just going to either be angry or confused. Yep. Um, Maybe you actually have some advice for that, Jim, for people of how to kind of shift gears between um, disciplines and, and readers and themes so yeah. you can so you can give everything a, a fair shake, if you will. And then I want to talk a little bit yeah. more about the paranormal stuff before we hit yeah. questions. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, um, I think, yeah, that's that's a great question, you know, because I, I, I actually, if, if I may in all humility, I think I'm pretty good at that. Right. <laughs> to, to, you know, like I, I, as, as you can see, that's I shift why I'm gears. asking your yeah. advice. Yeah. You I shift gears all that. the time. And I, um, I, I also like have had like major, like, like phases in my life, like my intellectual life, well, my life in general, we all do that, but like in my intellectual life too. Um, and I, I think, I think the number one thing for me on that is to, uh, Re, like just to first and foremost keep in mind this is not about like like philosophy right understanding right it's not about commitment right it's 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 a it's about learning right it's about understanding it's about finding things out okay and yeah. i think a lot of times we very very early get committed to certain things and then we just have to like like we 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 spend our time defending that and filtering everything with respect to that, right? Rather than like taking something on its own right. Okay. So I think, yeah. I think you have to just like let that go if you're going to do anything but just be narrow, right? Oh, such a good point. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's, and it's, it's Pat Flynn 101. Like, how do you become a generalist, right? You have to be a short term specialist. There it is. You read this but, book. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so, that's if right. I'm going to, if I'm going to like really understand, say, you know, this is my new obsession is object oriented ontology, right? If I'm really going to understand it, right. Um, I'm going to have to let go of certain things or just like put some things aside and just say, okay, let these people teach me what they're up to. Right. Yep. And quit trying to always trend. Well, what does it say about my other commitments? What does it say about it? What does it say about it? Cause then I'm fighting with it by four I've even learned it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you have to take this risk of letting what might be, you know, uh, a moronic spin doctor at the end of the day rule your mind. Right. <laughs> so you can find out if this is a moronic spin doctor. <laughs> that's my not, new right? band name, moronic spin doctor. <laughs> it's, 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 thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank that's you. better than the Walker Shark. Taco. Taco. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> Moronic spin doctor. Right? I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Self-indulgent yeah. spin doctor moron. Right. right. Yeah, I hope that... there's like like it's like uh it's concept rock with costumes and makeup too. <laughs> Man, if I was in charge of the band, dude, it would be such flagrant nonsense. But yes. but but yeah. but un but thankfully I'm not the band leader. So I'm just yeah, exactly. I'm just the hired gun guitarist. So if I've you could get a Stonehenge thing. model involved, I really want that. Dude, right. I, I mean yeah. look, let me just Get, let me get this out there because I know you'll appreciate it. I was talking yeah. to my wife about this yesterday, and she, and she would, yeah, she's definitely not on board with this because she, she's not okay with me making a public ass of myself, even though I am. That if like if you're going to do be like a cover band, my thought is like you just got you have to be interesting. You have to be different in some way. So like yeah. what I would want to do is not only like cover more interesting tunes, which I think our band kind of does right now, uh, but I would want to do like the Spinal Tap thing, like where we intentionally like act as if we're trying to do something cool that always goes at least a little bit wrong right yeah. and so like it looks embarrassing but it's fun it's fun it's funny yeah. to us yeah. but people are laughing at us but they don't they yeah. don't know that uh that pat flynn is actually intending to like like make yeah, yeah, myself yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> look like look like the guy who never quite was the star musician that he still thinks that he is yeah. you know what i mean playing at the walk show academy i would just want to lean fully into that yeah <laughs> well see because like here's the thing is okay 
which this is awesome. Okay, so we'll come back to the thing that I'm saying, but but like we'll come back if, to the ontology if, stuff. Later. You're not this is you're not yeah. really really pulling off irony if you want people to know you're being ironic. Right. Exactly. It's sort of like when you watch like a dark humor movie, mm -hmm. and then in the end they blink and wuss out and give you a happy ending. Yeah. It's like no, you're not really doing the thing there, right? Like if I'm right. going to be ironic, I have to be comfortable with people thinking. That I'm that a I'm moron. a moron. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. absolutely. Right. Because because the joke's on them, then, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like like they. You get it. I knew you would yeah. get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what I mean? you know what I mean? Like like no. If I'm gonna be ironic, I have to go all the way, right? right. It's like 100%. it's like when I tell my students I hate them. I never blink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I never blink, <laughs> right? Because otherwise, because because otherwise you're not really being. Well, am I being ironic? <laughs> right. But but, but you, like you never. You're not really being ironic, right? You're, you're, yeah. you, you know, you know. So you have to, you have to like go all the way with that, yeah. right? And say, yeah, if these people really think I believe I'm Ziggy Stardust, then that's what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> then I win, right? Yeah, because I'm playing the part of the guy who wants to believe he's Ziggy Stardust, and if I'm convincing at it, then I've won, right? right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's yeah, that's that's great. Now let's let's tie yeah. it back into what you're we talking yeah. about with the with anyway. the boss. Yeah, yeah. No, so so. So I, I do believe like if you're going to do this, you have to like be willing to like put your, your commitments at risk, right. And like allow yourself to be convinced and not just simply go into everything with an apologetic mindset. Do, yeah. do, do you see what I mean? Right. Yeah. So I think well, that I, does bar you off from getting yeah, it. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to give an example. So I, I, as I've mentioned before, I'm doing this now quite extensive research project. I've got one paper from it that I, I hope to ship off somewhere soon. And I'm already thinking about another one where I'm trying to, trying to examine what it, what exactly is the relationship to be had between theories of essentially ordered causation of medieval theorists like Scotus and Aquinas and contemporary theories of grounding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm testing the thesis or the hypothesis that we should consider grounding to be an instance of or a species of uh, essentially ordered ordered causation. But, you know, as I as I do the research and I read the various grounding theorists, my conclusion in my first paper is just try to be honest. I'm like, there's a plausible connection here, yeah. Um, but that's about as far as I can go. And part of the problem there is just like even within theories of grounding, there's so much convolutedness and lack of consensus. Um, and that and that is me trying to do what you advised, Jim, of just trying to be letting the grounding theorists speak for themselves and teach me what they're what they're trying to trying to teach or advocate for. And not just force it into a framework, even if I think it would be cool if there was like a strict identity there. Um, right. but that wouldn't be the honest story. The honest story is like, Hey, there's a lot of really interesting connections here. And I think this deserves further attention. And maybe this camp can help clarify and inform this camp and vice versa. But this is as far as I can go with it. And so kind of maybe lackluster conclusion for the end of my first paper, but that's, that's just how I read it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, and, and I think, I think it, it cause, cause you, what you're in process, right? You're, yeah. you're trying to figure it out. you there's a big, which is, we've talked about this earlier and like what we think what philosophy or what I think what philosophy is, is, is there's a great big, I don't know in the background. And that's why mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like still in motion on this. Right. And so a lot of your conclusions are going to be kind of lackluster. I'm not sure. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could go this way, maybe go that way. I'm figuring it out. Stay tuned for the next episode kind of thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's right. all about that soap opera sequence. right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and so, and I think like when you get in the nitty gritty is, um, and you'll see this a lot of times, you know, with, 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 I'm sure everyone does it, but I, I've experienced a lot with Thomas, like where they'll fight over like nomenclature, they'll fight over terminology, right? Like really hard. Well, that's not what that word means. Yeah. But in this other system, it does mean it's used differently. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I find a lot of people, people just cannot get over that. Right. And I think you do have to, at that level of just vocabulary, like figure out what is meant by the terms here. And yeah. do you know what I mean? Like you see this all the time, like, not, not just from Thomas, but uh, with the word evidence, right? <laughs> like it just like people use that word equivocally and miss each other constantly, right? Yes. Um, it's what we've talked about this quite a bit. And I think a lot of times too, you just have to like, like really to have the patience to like actually learn people's terminology and what they're up to, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you an example, not, not specifically that, but just like with this kind of openness. So I, you know, I read this paper by um, uh, Graham Harmon yesterday. It was one of the, it's like kind of a, the grand poop of the object oriented ontology thing and something that I, I like by disposition would not be necessarily inclined to agree mm -hmm. with. Okay. Sure. 
But although, yeah, he's making a case. Um, but this paper, Arist he had wrote a paper called Aristotle with a Twist. Very interesting paper. Mm -hmm. And like really brought out some stuff in Aristotle that um, I think has been underemphasized in like the schools that I'm coming from, right? Yeah. Um, and so like really, like whatever, whether I end up like going all the way with this guy and like agreeing with him, there's some things I can take back now to my own thinking, even, even if I, you know, even if I think this position is deeply flawed, but I only got that because I was willing to actually listen to this dude. Yes. See what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, yeah. that's an excellent point. And this is, this is, this is really good. I hope that people find, I hope that people find this helpful, like the kind of Pat and Jim raw in process. And also just because as we talked about last week, Jim, like Posse, we agree with is it's an attitude, right? It's a, it's yeah. a disposition. Uh, so yep. hopefully we're, we're highlighting how to have that. Shall we, should we turn to some questions, Professor? Let's do it, man. Yeah. All right. I'm going to bounce around here. A lot of, a lot of good stuff. Uh, Octus has a good question. He says, is God in the Aristotelian sense a substance or does he transcend that category? Well, I'll just say very quickly before Jim hops in that for Aquinas, mm -hmm. God is not a substance. He's a subsistent. Yeah. He's a subsistent. Yeah. So he definitely transcends that category for Aquinas. I'm not sure how you would uh, articulate Aristotle's perspective on this, though, Jim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Aristotle does not put him in a category. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, good. Good. good uh, you, for Aristotle, the, the notion of substance is pretty tied to material particular. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And uh, I, f I feel that's something actually Thomas overlook, especially because I'm doing this big, another big study and paper on composition. And I emphasize as I, because um, I'm, I'm arguing for a causal principle uh, of composite entities, that we must not call God a substance uh, for this reason. And Aquinas was right, that God is a subsistent, right? Because yeah. substance is going to carry connotations of comp composition with it according to a certain metaphysical framework. So you do have to escape that uh, with God. Uh, let's do a related one here. Infinitami, if I'm pronouncing that right, wants to know our favorite argument for the existence of God and why. Um, you know, I was talking about this uh, in in Tulsa afterwards on the on the show called the Catholic Man Show, and they asked me, and I'd be curious if you agree with this this mm -hmm. gym of like, you know, what's the uh, to kind of like play d devil's advocate of like if you were to press against Aquinas's objections or the the arguments for God that you think are the strongest, what would you do? And um, it made me, it made me think that um, the best argument for God, and I think you'll be sympathetic with this, Jim, as, as I think even skeptics like Bill Rowe were, mm -hmm. is it's not an argument. It's a commitment to the PSR and a principle of intelligibility. Yeah, yeah. And the way I think about it is the, the, a lot of the project in metaphysics and epistemology is one of, developing and articulating a system of explanation, an explanatory principle, right? And both the theist and naturalist have challenges here um, because for the theist, you don't want an explanatory principle that runs past God, right? And for the naturalist, you don't want an explanatory principle that runs to God, right? <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's the problem. So this is now, at the end of the day, I think the best argument for God is just getting the right explanatory principle. And I think the right explanatory principle is one that has to run to God and cannot possibly run beyond God. So an explanatory principle that would run beyond God would be something like everything has a cause. But that's just, we can know that that's false by logic and definition. So I don't think that that's too threatening. But I think as soon as you have an explanatory principle that doesn't transcend all natural categories, you do wind up in a sort of fundamental skepticism, right? Yeah. And yeah. so what I what I talked about with the dudes at the Catholic Man Show is I think that if for theists moving forward in the conversation, the project shouldn't be like defending any one of Aquinas's five ways or whatever. Because if I were being as skeptical as I could, I could object to all the five ways by just restricting explanatory principles, right? Of right. saying no, right. I just don't accept Aquinas's theory of explanation, right? I could just put brute facts <laughs> wherever I want. So right. really, the best argument for God, I think, just is a defense or commitment to the principle of sufficient reason, which, to my mind, pretty much underlies, if not all, many of the arguments for God that I find persuasive. What are your thoughts on all that? Do you, do you agree with it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, okay, I mean, this is like trivial, but unless you're going to go ontological argument, right, unless you're going to go full-blown, like, um moral moral argument right like divine command theory kind of argument then it seems like that's the only game in town right like like you're going to approach god as um or you, you know, I, 
you're going to like have some kind of causal inference going on here. Do you mm -hmm. see what I mean? So, so I, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. It would seem that unless you're going to take one of those other, the other approaches, I think the PSR is involved. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and, and like, kind of like, like to riff on that is so I, as you know, like, um, you know, I don't do much natural theology, philosophy, religion stuff anymore, but, um, I was, I've been very, very moved by that notion. Um, now, now his name's eluding me. Um, the guy who thinks God has to create, uh, infinitely many Leslie. worlds. Le John Leslie, John Leslie, like really kind of opened the scriptures for me when, you know, he, he's, he argued that he thinks that behind every cosmological argument is basically a demand, like a kind of like to say the only ultimate explanation would be a moral explanation for the universe, which is like it's a, very platonic, really, which mm -hmm. is very platonic. Yeah. And, and so I think like, so for him, and I think this is him really understanding Leibniz, right? Really understanding Leibniz in a way I don't think many people have, right? Is to see that like the only thing that would like the only thing that would ultimately satisfy the PSR would be some kind of explanation in terms of axiology or value, right? Like this world exists because it's a good one. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and the question is, well, what makes it so good? Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and really a teleological foundationalism. Let's call it. Yeah, that. Mm -hmm. exactly. And, and, and let's go back to like the very beginning. And, you know, why is Socrates in the Phaedo dissatisfied with the materialist explanations of the world that he was, you know, uh, confronted with in his era, according to Plato's reporting, is because none of them explained the world in terms of what he calls in the Phaedo mind noose. Right. OK. Uh, he's looking for a teleological, like 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 a reasons giving explanation, but in in that that psychological sense where reasons are goods, right? And that's why Plato says, you know, that ultimately, like it's the good, right? And Aristotle, you know, is his his god, right? Is this thing that all things desire, right? Okay, yeah, all right, you know, you know what I mean. And so for me, um, increasingly, like for me, like the most interesting argument for God's existence is actually the, the argument from motion in the metaphysics, mm -hmm. right? Which I know is like, okay, maybe like the least popular, right? Right. One. Okay. But, but I think it's cause like, like it's unpopular because we like, we don't understand what's actually going on there. Right. It's, it's like what's meant by motion, even like, like what, what, mo like what that thing, like what the deity's relationship to other things is such that it's moving them. Right. Mm -hmm. Is not causal in like, the modern sense that would compete with newton it's it's axiological right it's mm -hmm. desire that's, yeah. that's right you know what i mean so so for me uh that insight although you know like i, I agree with 100 the psr right but i think that the, the psr is itself only satisfied in this teleological value valued sense right mm -hmm. for that reason i've i've kind of like really gotten into that argument uh in the metaphysics right and yeah. you know, and kind of the spooky stuff in Plato. Yeah. Yeah. Which fits, which to my mind fits very well with a classical, uh, theistic conception, um, yeah. creation and all that. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That was, that was, that was really good. And hopefully the gentle listener is satisfied with that response. No refunds. Let's take uh Jim, feel free to grab whatever else. <laughs> yeah, no, you. You, yeah. No refunds. Cause you paid nothing for it. <laughs> Jan has a question for you, Jim. He's reading your book on yeah. philosophy of mind. And he says that he doesn't really understand why it's hard for emergentists and materialists to account for abstract thought. Can you go into this a little bit more? And thank you. Yeah, as far as as far as materialists go, I think, um, you know, their problems begin long before we get to abstract thought, like just even even qualitative uh, aspects of consciousness are already out. Right. I mean, it just when you when you when you say I'm only going to. Uh, allow the quantifiable into uh my my system right then how you get qualitative out of that is is forever a mystery right perennially right mm -hmm. uh, and then even if you think even in terms of abstraction right you know once again um abstractions right uh concepts uh, etc don't make differences in in quantifiable time and space therefore right it's very hard to like give give an account of how you would get those out of like like a straight materialism okay now emergentism uh i increasingly find uh difficult i mean actually difficult is the wrong word right but i find i find like like arguments against emergentism are for me less and less certain okay though though i still have my doubts right because 
I do think there's a sense in which conceptual content uh, can be emergent. Okay. So for instance, uh, this is an example from um, Andy Clark, you know, like right now, if uh, like landscape architecture architects generally don't, when, when they, they build a campus, they don't put sidewalks in, but they just wait uh, for uh, people to walk and they'll just make paths in the grass in the most efficient way possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'll actually get this. And then, then if you do the mathematics after the fact, it almost always works out that that mathematically, that is the most efficient way to get from building to building, just given what the normal human traffic is going to be, which we can't predict up front. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you have there? You have like a, like a, like a conceptual content to what people are doing there. Like they're, they're operating by a kind of concept, right. Implicitly unknown. Right. So I think there's a sense in which in that way you could say there could be conceptual content with that that is truly emergent there. Okay. The problem is just no but none of those parts of that system of the humans walking are aware of the conceptual content. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So I think I think I want to give the emergentists their due to say, yeah, you might have uh emergent conceptuality in like this broad small c sense, right? Yeah that you could have behaviors that are that are done by a bunch of subpersonal agents mm -hmm. that from a personal perspective we can look at it and see there's a conceptual like like scheme to what's going on there okay mm -hmm. but the important thing is is none of them are aware of it and right. I, and it's hard to buy that somehow like the system of right. people walking to the various buildings on campus is somehow aware of it in that first order sense and i want to go even yeah. further and say but, it well, would be well, one yeah, more point, no, yeah, is that, but I do think though what I'm what, what I'm doing though here is I'm actually and this is not something I would have liked to have said that I was doing when I wrote the first book is I'm falling back onto a kind of quality argument here because it's still like the first person perspective thing that's 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 doing it right yeah so like you know damn it Thomas Nagel was right okay I guess I have to just say <laughs> that right but you know because and, and I know like like Oderberg and I and I think I even get snotty about this in the first book actually talks about a qualia of conceptuality. Mm -hmm that he thinks is the decisive thing. It's not just the conceptual content, it's the qualitative awareness of the conceptual content. I think he says that in, in his book on essentialism. Yeah. And at the time I remember like reading, I'm like, oh, that's just silly. It's not about quality, but actually I'm seeing it now. Yeah. It's conscious, it's, the, it's not just the, the conceptual content, it's the consciousness of the conceptual content. That's the right. question. Yeah. So sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I was just going to reiterate the point we had in a previous conversation, which goes back to a, a deep but profound point that people like Richard Taylor made that's been further developed by James Ross, is that it would be a mistake to even think that there's any conceptual content there unless we're already in a realm of meaning, right? Yeah. Unless yeah. there's already a fundamental yeah. – because that's all determinate semantic content. Yeah. meaning that realm is mind that's just what the realm of mind yeah. is yeah. right so if you think that comes out of anything that isn't a realm of mind then you've made a mistake of interpretation right and the the example that taylor gives is like imagine that a bunch of sticks fell from the sky and arranged a very complex sentence right you might think that that's improbable in naturalism but that isn't the point uh the point is you would be mistaken to think that it actually means something yeah. Right. Even yeah. if it's even if it spells something to you, if it did not already emerge from a realm of prior mind. Yeah. And to me, that is that's yes, that's clearly yeah. correct. Right. Yeah. So th and that's, of course, compatible with with emergentism. And I don't have a problem with emergentism yeah. in principle. I think an Aristotelian paradigm makes a lot of sense of emergent phenomena. Yeah, for example, yeah, yeah. but I, I'll be damned if you will ever try to give me an account of how you can make sense of determinate semantic content coming from a mindless foundation. I just don't think it's yeah. possible. Right. I mean, I think, I think something like, like Clark's example of, you know, the people walking to the buildings and then, and I think it's, that's an example, I think, where you do have semantic content that's going on there, but it's, it's not explicit. Right. And, and, there, and, and I think, I think, what you're meaning here by determinant is that it's 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 not just like the system could be so interpreted right it's that the system actually is so interpreted right it's a it's a yeah. formal sign in a, traditional yeah. terminology and, yeah and this is where i think your german idealists are getting something really right here is mm -hmm. that it it it's it, and once again this is where you know like i had to learn to like like take 
consciousness seriously in a way that I wasn't like, okay, mm -hmm. that it's this, it, it's self-consciousness. It's, it's the, it's like cons, the, I think that accompanies the conceptual judgment is the thing that's always left out of, right. Any kind of attempt to like reduce it to subpersonal entities. Do, do you see mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it's like, there is that self-consciousness. Like I'm, I, I'm, a, I am aware of myself as aware of the conceptual contents that makes the conceptual contents explicit, right? But there's always this irreducible leftover of the self-conscious awareness that you're never going to get from those self, those subpersonal entities, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Even if we admit the conceptual conceptuality was like implicit, right, right in it all along, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think this is this is why, like, and I think you know this. Uh, Gavin, I think, dragged me to like kind of see this the right way. Is that I think this is really what's going on in John McDowell's. Mm -hmm. Stuff, it, right? it, because he emphasizes conceptual content all the way down right? all the way down yeah, yeah. well mm -hmm. implicit implicit all yeah down, implicit yeah. right yeah uh -huh. and and i think i think there's there's problems with that but not problems that like involve disagreeing here right mm -hmm. and um yeah so i highly recommend i think his clearest statement on this by mcdowell is his he has a, a paper just on called avoiding the myth of the given right mm -hmm. which I, I think is very very helpful in this yeah yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Really good. Really good questions today. Always yeah. good questions from the end. Jim, feel free to grab anything that jumps mm -hmm. out at you too. Don't let me, uh, don't let me dominate here. You know, mm -hmm. let's, uh, I think we got a fitness one here. Let's do it. Suppose I guess you were lifting weights, but after a set of amount of reps, you can't lift that set amount of reps away. Oh, uh, do you take longer breaks to finish the set or to go on to, for a smaller weight? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I guess there's a question like, how do you just get through the day and, or as opposed to like, how's my programming going? Right. Yeah. So let me, let me just, yeah. uh, try and re restate the question before you answer it. So yeah. the idea is you're lifting weights, you're using a certain amount of weight and you've done say, uh, five reps per set. Right. Uh, but then you get to a certain set and you can no longer lift that weight for those reps of that intensity anymore. His question is, do you take longer breaks? Or do you decrease weight? Is how I'm how I'm reading it. So yes, yeah, yeah take it away, Jim. <laughs> yeah, well, I just th I think okay. So like you know how you I think the less interesting worry is like how I finish that workout. The more interesting worry worry is that your programming is probably off, <laughs> right? Like like you probably either like you like you, like you 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 either got your like estimated max too high in the first place, or your 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 reps are too high or something like that. So I think you just need to go back and look at like what your actual program is, right? Because I think if you have an effective strength program, uh, especially in the in the kind of the, the way you and I think about strength training, uh, th there should never be a question whether I can get the reps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in in long term training in situations where you where there is a question to get the reps is going to burn you out, hurt you, and you're going to go back to being like a fat garbage piece. Yeah, so, <laughs> so so don't do that. On top <laughs> of being a moronic spin doctor, <laughs> it's like being a moronic spin doctor. Yeah. So so I would say like go back and look at your programming. And, and you should have this set up so that there, like, I don't think you should ever walk in the gym and there's a question of whether I can complete the work. Right. A, a, and a good program should, should specify that it should clarify it. Right. Um, yep. it should tell you sort of in advance what you should do in a situation like that. If, if programming is sort of leaving that an open question for you, then something is missing in that program. Something's I would missing. argue. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, by the way, yeah, this is philosophy for the people, but obviously we're happy to talk uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, as well. We, yeah. yeah. Because it's we, kind of a hangover from our old Freaky Friday when the channels were crossover and where's anything goes, right? Maybe it, we'll have to like. It's still anything goes. So if people yeah, want to ask a fitness question here, you're certainly welcome to. Um, yeah. Fitness, so, rock and roll. Yeah. We um, will not discuss vaccines here on Philosophy for the Future. I'm just, I'm, I'm happy to discuss anything. I just don't want it, the channel to get banned after we've just crossed the thousand yeah, no. subscriber mark. Yeah. Please, <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do so it gentle the... people, please. Yeah. Like, 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 good taste and common sense. Always until roll, until, until Musk buys YouTube, <laughs> please, yeah, exactly. John, don't don't get us banned. <laughs> Speedwagon wants to know what is your who's your favorite contemporary philosopher, Jim? Who on yeah, who in the contemporary scene is inspiring you these days? Or has inspired uh, well, I, well, I just mentioned that that uh, Graham Graham Harmon guy that I've been into, right? Um, I mean Charles Taylor, you know, uh, continues to be important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, McIntyre continues to be important to me. Um, yeah, yeah I, I would go with those. Uh, her, 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 Hubert Dreyfus, but he just he just passed away. Yeah. Right? 
there's there's so many i mean we we actually live i think in a pretty good time there's a lot of nonsense and sophistry and garbage out there but there's a lot of there's a lot of great thinkers too there, there really are so the whole obviously i'm deeply inspired by the the big tent to mystic tradition i've mentioned lonergan before norris clark maritan uh they're all deceased so if we go if we go to living though i think there's there's just a lot of people doing a lot of uh good work out there you mentioned um the the retrieving realism band the the yep. really yeah you you yep. you set me you set me on to them yep um oh wait, well, no, wait. D -d -d john mcdowell robert mcdowell, brandon. Yeah, yeah brandon um yeah. in philosophy of religion a lot of great a lot of great thinkers like people like alex Proust inspire me i talk about psr i mean his psr book yep. is one of my favorite philosophical yep. works of all time let alone yep. just in the contemporary scene uh marcus gabriel uh a, a contemporary german philosopher who, who writes a lot in english um is is uh, someone I, I find extremely interesting right uh there's another guy named sebastian reudel mm -hmm. uh who's another contemporary german philosopher uh who has a, a couple of his books have been translated a lot of his essays are in english so uh, I, those guys also in that in that kind of pittsburgh school vein really inspire me yeah yeah let me just shift gears again to a fitness one just because this grabbed my eye callum said pat and jim have given up the bench press barbell and dumbbell i li literally just floor press now and love it no shoulder issues should this exercise be, be normalized uh so first off a uh, flat bench um i've got i'm i'm a pretty mobile and i've got some pretty uh pretty good shoulders thankfully but flat bench does bother my shoulder so um i i feel good with uh dumbbell bench especially a slight inclined dumbbell bench feels really good for me and fl yes floor presses feel uh awesome i don't do them as much because i feel good with dips and dumbbell press but i would say if you're having success with floor press uh power to you brother jim do you do much uh floor pressing these days i'll say this i will never bench press full range of motion with a barbell ever again yeah. <laughs> i think that that is over for me and i just just that position does not feel right you know, you know what i mean and I know so many dudes get in their forties and they stick with the bench press and they end up wrecked. Snap city, baby. Snap city. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I won't do it. Uh, I do, you know, in, um, I, I, I'm still doing in a lot of overhead pressing, especially since I fell in with the hammer. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, but and that does not bother my, when done properly and responsibly, right. Does not bother my shoulders. Uh, and I do though, I'll throw in some like floor pressy stuff, you know, as part of like, you know, conditioning circuits and stuff like that. And I, so I think, I think the floor press with like kettlebells is a pretty good mo movement, right? It's money. I, I, and I, I, I would also money. recommend do it with a slight hip bridge too. Yes. Um, that, yes. that way you will get further range of motion there. It turns into a slight yep. sort of decline press, but that is one of my favorite variations. Oh, yeah. yeah. One mm -hmm. thing I like is take, take your kettlebell by the ball. Yeah. And do like a crush press, like bridge up. Yeah. 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 Do a crush press. Yeah. Yeah, like you're crushing a angle. human skull in jujitsu yeah. at the same time, yeah, man. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's actually one, one of my visualization most, is really important. Yeah, like the, the, the head crush is one of my most effective jujitsu moves. Yeah, right? and so just this pure, helps me. Right, just pure brute. Yeah, just I just I just get them by the ears, and just crush their skulls. <laughs> right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can only problem is is what you do it once, you've lost a partner. So <laughs> you have to be careful. Right. Right. It's probably save it for competition. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, Parisa says, Pat, what are the problems with Dr. Sidgwati's argument from grounding? Is the translation uh, from language of contemporary metaphysics to one of Thomas possible? So Parisa, I'm not sure if you were here earlier in the conversation, but I literally talked about how this is a current research project of mine where I'm trying to see if there is a thesis that can be uh, made if contemporary grounding should be identified as a species of essentially ordered causation. So Stay tuned. Uh, that episode is coming forth, and I hope to have the a uh, few people are looking over the draft of my paper now, and then I'll I'll ship it around, and we'll see if it if it gets picked up anywhere. But um, Sijuati is brilliant guy. I love him. I love I love I love Joshua. Really cool guy with a really cool story. But his argument for grounding, at least he's the dude is he's got a lot of stuff out recently. So the one the one paper that he was on this channel talking about is not it's not a causal argument for God. He's what he's doing is he's taking sort of Swinburne's methodology and saying God is the best explanation for why there are any grounding relations at all. Right. So so if you're familiar with with Swinburne's work, Swinburne, um, yeah, he's more on the sort of uh, cumulative case 
probabilistic abductive approach to God, where he's saying, look, we have all this, this data and the best simplest explanation that leads us to anticipate this data is clearly theism. Sidhuwadi is just bringing in a metaphysical data point. He's saying, look, we have this sort of this contemporary metaphysics of grounding, which itself seems to stand in need of relation. Why are there any grounding relations at all? And he's saying that this is actually something that is well expected on theism, but you actually cannot make sense of it or account for it on a naturalistic framework. So in that sense, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's like, <laughs> if, you, if you're into that sort of Swinburnian approach, I think what Sidhuwadi is doing is actually really cool. But you have to understand that's his approach. He's not making a causal argument for the existence of God in the way like Aquinas would using contemporary grounding theories, if that if that makes sense. Jim, did I explain that this clearly? Yeah, enough? I have to admit I was distracted because I was asking my yeah. children for, for permission to use my car. So, oh. <laughs> yes, teen life, man, teen life. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. But anyways, those uh, that's... But not says I have not thought about grounding. That's not a thing I've done much. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but it is, it is. And I've seen a couple of people on, I'm not saying this is you, Parisa, but I've seen people just totally not get what Sidhuwadi is up to right. Uh, he's not making a sort of classical argument for God from contemporary theories of grounding. He's doing a contemporary argument for God, the Swinburnian approach, using a metaphysical data point as yeah. sort of inductive support, if you will. Right. Um, all right, let's take a, take a few more, and then uh, cool. then we'll bounce out here. So again, uh, Jim, feel free to grab whatever uh, looks interesting to you here. Lots of lots of good conversations, guys. So uh, keep it coming, keep it coming. Oh, I saw I saw one that just just popped in. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I lost it. So let me just. Uh, Someone asked, what is a guilty pressure for us? I think I think probably pleasure is the question. <laughs> let's take it. What's, what's your guilty pleasure? What's your guilty pressure? <laughs> um, guilty pleasure for me. Um, well, I mean, that could that could become intimate, but uh, right. Uh, let me think here. Um, OK, here, here's one is. My kids and I tend to watch some pretty stupid reality TV sometimes, like Swamp People. Like we went, we went a long way with Swamp People for several, several seasons, right? So that that's that's a guilty pleasure for me. Yeah. Um, but I mean, so you know, I, I've admitted this before, so I don't know how guilty I feel about it. But like when I watch TV, it's usually like the lowest of lowbrow entertainment, like yeah. '80s and '90s professional wrestling. Um, but I mean, that's, I think that's like, unfortunately, um, the best that we, that we can be offered from television <laughs> for any say, sorry. it's just also, it's all such dumb nonsense that if you're just gonna, if you're gonna hop into the circus, you might as well, you might as well go all the way. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I feel particularly guilty about that. You know what I've been watching Jim with, uh, with Christine at night, she really likes Magnum PI. Right. So, so we've been doing, yeah, yeah. we've been nice, doing, nice. we've been doing some reruns, of Mag which, dude, I've gotten into it. Uh, yeah, again, yeah. I don't know if I feel guilty about it, but I'm like, hey, yeah, it's no. actually yeah, a yeah. pretty, yeah. pretty. It's one of those things where you're enjoying this, and you're like, what does it say about me? That I find so watching yeah. all these Magnum yeah. PI reruns. So I don't yeah. know. I'll just I'll throw out Magnum for you guys. Yeah. Somebody asked a question about ethical arguments for veganism. Um, and I'll say this is like my my take on that is I, I let's distinguish between the, the, the welfare interests of the moral community trump the welfare interests of the non-moral community is yeah. the way i think about it so that doesn't mean that well, animals don't deserve any protections or rights yeah. but in general i think any arguments for veganism are going to fail on those grounds so yeah mm -hmm. yeah see for me it's just it's it just seems to me that like uh we are designed to eat them and they are designed to eat us Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if you think there's anything like a normativity that's to be derived from nature, it is very difficult to say that there should not be any eating of animals going on. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when it, I think it's pretty clear that we're, we're evolved to do it. Okay. Now you, we can debate whether you can draw normative premises from, from nature. Okay. But if, if you do think there are norms of nature, it's very difficult to say in principle right now, do I worry though about like the treatment of, um, 
of animals, like 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 the factory farming thing and all that. Yeah, increasingly I worry about that. Yeah. Right? Okay. And I, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to dispose myself in light of it. Right. But if you want to just go like straight up, like you shouldn't be eating sentient thing. I think there's there's a pretty good case that you probably there's going to the plant world is pretty sentient too. Okay. And increasingly, uh, like I think, if like consciousness is much more ubiquitous throughout nature, right? Mm -hmm. Then we might say, especially if you if you're willing to broker in terms of not self conscious but conscious systems and things like right. that. Well, look, you're going to run out of things to eat pretty quickly. Yeah, okay. yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think this is where natural law uh, is. I think actually, again, really helpful. And why do I like natural law so much? Well, I think it makes the best sense of our best moral intuitions. And I think we have a strong intuition that it is certainly in a general way quite acceptable to eat meat and eat animals, right? But we also, if we're being honest, like most of us have an intuition that there seems to be something wrong about factory, this extreme sort of factory farming and stuff, yep. right? Yep. And I think natural law can help secure those intuitions. Yep. And it could even justify factory farming in certain circumstances, right? where say there's yeah. a, an extreme need for food, but there could also be conditions and circumstances where, no, we should, we should yeah. work to, um, not do this. Right. And, and I mean, in personally in my yeah. life, we get all of our meat, pretty much all of our meat from the local farms that, you know, do yeah. the humane treatment. Cause I think that that's, yeah. I mean, in the position that I'm in, we can do that right yeah. now, if my family was crushed by poverty and yeah. I couldn't uh, afford the grass fed local meat, would I still think that it's morally okay to get the cheaper Aldi chicken? Yes, in that circumstance, yeah. right? So yeah. circumstances matter, but I think natural so, law can help you think through this in a in a clear way that actually helps to make sense of our best intuitions on the matter, right? Mm -hmm. The monocrop agriculture, like kind of rape of the earth agriculture, right? And and like very cruel, like you know, factory farm, factory, you know, husbandry practices with animals to support an obese population makes very little sense <laughs> agreed right? yeah uh -huh. okay yeah you know, like like anyone who sits back and looks at like like you know, the prover proverbial martians come here and check out what we're doing they would look at that and say that is crazy <laughs> that is absolutely crazy and, th and this to me is like here is 80 here's reason 87 right uh as to like why we have like gone over the cliff into a sort of technologically driven nihilism right right <laughs> right it's like, is is that yeah um Haley, i see should you post again uh yeah go ahead sorry if i'm missing some some questions here as always i get i get sucked in by by jim's uh romantic interludes that i i don't always um keep up with the comments so if there's something you really want us to take please uh, go ahead and and post it um Oh, here it is. I think Haley, is this your your original question? Have either of you thought uh, or heard of the presuppositional apologetic method? Thoughts, if if you have, uh, yeah, I'm I'm familiar with it. I have to be honest that I have not spent a lot of time with uh, presuppositionalists. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I I understand what their their general approach is. I had James Anderson on uh, to talk about. Uh, a very interesting argument that he gives for the existence of God, a uh, sort of eternal truce argument. But my understanding is Anderson himself is quite a strong, devoted presuppositionalist. And we've been in conversation about maybe having him on to articulate uh, that position. But I have to just be honest and say I have not spent enough time with those thinkers to uh, give. I can't say I agree or disagree because I can't say I fully understand yet. Right. <laughs> you know, right. Jim, I don't know. How about you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't I haven't looked at it at all. And as you know, I'm not really an apologetics guy. Mm -hmm. Right. So Yeah. So yeah, and I try to resist that that uh title is as well, or at least clarify it. And and part of it is I know enough about uh the 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 large camp of presuppositionalism uh to to say that like anything else, there's many different thinkers in that camp. Uh, so even though there's certain versions that I think are probably almost certainly not right or uh, viciously uh, circular in certain respects, there seems to be, as is the case with anything else, more nuanced positions. And it's those more nuanced positions that I, I feel just in due diligence I haven't spent enough time with before I can speak honestly or intelligently uh, about it. So... Um, and there's different kind of like stances that people take. So like Anderson's interesting because um, he calls himself a presuppositionalist, yet he also still does natural theology. But I've also seen other presuppositionalists that just like hate natural theology, huh. right? That, that 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 like strongly attack it. So clearly, I don't think Anderson is in that camp. 
And so I would just be curious to hear more of his thoughts. So sorry, Haley, not a super helpful answer, but it's the most honest one I can give. Um, do, 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 do. All right, let's do, let's do two more, Jim, if you got time for that. Cool. And uh, let's good. see here. You pick one, I'll pick one. How's yeah, that? I'm scrolling through. Okay, this might be a cheat, but Rockford Files. Dude, I've never what's, watched it. What's yeah, better, they, Rockford Files or Magna P.I.? Rockford Files. Is no it really? Doubt, oh, gosh, yeah. I've never – so sell, sell me on it. Why should I not watch Magnum P.I. Because, tonight because the Rockford Files? Jim Rockford is so much more the unflinching, crusty anti-hero uh, compared to, to Magnum. Right. It's a Tom Selleck, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like I forget the name of the actor from Rockford what, what, Files. What years was Rockford Files on? I, I think you're talking like late 70s, early 80s. Okay. Right? So, so it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like basically, what is Magnum PI? Magnum PI is like huffing on the dust left in the wake of the Rockford Files, right? It's like, it's, <laughs> Dang, it's like, it's like Jim has you know, made his position. Yeah, I, made it, I made it clear. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, Jim Rockford, man, he like, he like, like lives in a trailer. Like, he, he, you know, he, he, he drinks booze and eats steaks right you know drives yeah. a muscle car okay right? so now we know yeah. where um lethal weapon got its inspiration from. exactly yeah, yeah exactly yeah exactly right like i think like so many of your like 80s uh like cop anti-hero types are like they're all channeling jim rockford yeah are they even comparable because the style sounds so different than magnum is magnum yeah. like magnum has a few serious episodes but it's more of a light-hearted show overall, yeah you well know? no i mean rockford files is too i mean it's 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 network television right <laughs> yeah. you know from you know what i mean but and you know uh you get like you know they both i'll say this is they both had remember like like in the uh um in the 70s 80s like cop tv shows you had to have like theme music yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't know if that's still a thing anymore. There's had to be theme music that would like repeat throughout the series. They both had very good, like 70s rock theme music. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Uh, how, all right. For my purposes, Magnum or McGav uh, MacGyver for you, Jim? Uh, you know what? I barely watched MacGyver. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm in a position to judge that. So we so gave MacGyver, we gave MacGyver a shot because my, my thought was MacGyver was always like this super goofy show. Man, that show is actually pretty dark at times. And my wife really? is like, I don't want to watch this anymore at night. She's like, it's getting me too worked up. So that's when we, yeah. <laughs> we switched over to uh to to Magnum. Yeah. Uh -huh. How about the A Team? Yeah, dude. We uh we did watch <laughs> right. a little bit of A Team. Yeah, good. Yeah. Dude, the eighties, some of these eighties shows are really good. And I, I missed them because I was I was born in the late eighties, so I didn't I didn't right. grow up with that stuff. So I, I feel like there's just big treasure trove of stuff i remember I that the 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 a team initially when it came out was a little racy mm -hmm. and i remember like having to get permission from my mom to watch the a team is it really i haven't watched yeah. it, enough of it yet to uh to to see we watched maybe like one or two episodes and i think we watched a pile or something like that anyways um all right let's uh i'll take two quick ones uh kedrick says uh any tips on how to approach Clark's uh, one in the many if someone doesn't have much prior knowledge in metaphysics? I actually think that is the, exactly the book to get if you don't have much yeah. prior knowledge in metaphysics. Yeah. I think it's a, a phenomenal introduction. Uh, Clark uh, manages to do that very difficult thing of being both uh, getting su sufficient depth and rigor, yet he does he makes it really accessible and there's a lot of hand-holding. So I actually very much recommend that as an introductory uh, uh, text. Um but maybe you've maybe you've started it and you're still um still I don't know maybe feeling like uh, you could use a little extra hand holding Jim what do you what do you recommend uh, as well for sort of introductions to to metaphysics yeah yeah I mean I I, I think you know um Clark's is, is is absolutely like the one I would go with right I'll say it. here's one you should avoid it's uh, Father Owen's oh uh, yeah beginning um, christian metaphysics yeah that is not which, a beginner's one which is all. neither neither for beginners nor is it particularly christian right <laughs> it's not anti-christian right? but it's, yeah. it's it is a hardcore introduction to like Aristotelian metaphysics yeah right? and like yeah, existentialist like, Thomism. you're right it's a yeah, good book but it fools a, book. it fools it fools a lot of people because it is people. not beginner at all yeah that book is on like <laughs> so every funny. every novice's uh bookshelf but there's not a single underline after page four right, right. yeah <laughs> yeah you know I mean? yeah right so I, I i don't i don't really have a more basic introduction that i would recommend recommend um than clark's because most of your really basic introductions 
are going to be like ba- introductions to like standard contemporary metaphysics where you're just going to get like, you know, here's a chapter in universals, here's a chapter on free will, here's a chapter on maybe composition, stuff like that, which I, which I don't think that's what the listener is looking for, right? He's probably looking for an introduction to like systematic scholastic metaphysics. And I just don't think there's a better one than Clark's. So I would just yeah. continue to struggle with Clark. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right. I have two minutes, so let's see what we can do in two minutes, Jim. Uh, let's do this one from computational theists. I have seen some Christians use the Catholic abuse scandal as an argument against Catholicism. How do you respond to that? Yeah. I mean, so first off, you always say that, I mean, abuse is horrific, should enrage everybody. It needs to be battled. It needs to be condemned. But if we're just trying to, to be honest about assessing a worldview paradigm, um, I mean, on a very, in a very simple way, um, some piece of evidence E can't count against uh, a theory unless the theory predicts not E. So show me where Catholicism predicts moral impeccability. In fact, Catholicism, unfortunately, predicts sort of the opposite, even among the hierarchy. Um, so I'll say as somebody who converted to the Catholic Church, I was very much bothered, bothered by the scandals, as I am in every institution. So we want to be statistically honest about um, not not like how pervasive abuse instances are not just in religious institutions, but at large. And that's not, again, to downplay the fact that they happen in religious institutions. In fact, I think we should hold a higher standard for religious institutions, precisely because of religious institutions, right? But again, um, so even though I think it's understandable why people react the way they do to this, I think if you're just trying to assess sort of honestly and rationally whether or not that is a reason you should become Catholic or Christian, right, in general... Uh, no, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a, uh, a good argument. It certainly didn't um, persuade me against the Catholic Church, even though if it was something that, um, you know, weighs on you from a from a cultural perspective uh, and stuff like that, which it does. I don't know, Jim, any further thoughts on? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I agree with you, you know, from sort of a evidential apologetic standpoint. Right. But but I'll say this is like. If, if you wanted to go around and try to act as if you were not, in fact, an institution established by an act of, of the second person of the Trinity, I think what's happened with the scandals would be a good way to do it, right? Do you know what I mean? And, and I think I think they, they have made it very, very hard, much, much harder for us than it has to be, right? Yeah. Okay, and and I don't think we should be terribly quick to forgive them for that. Yeah, no, of, of yeah, yeah, of course, mean, yeah. And, so, and this is one of the reasons why I, I won't carry a lot of water. Not that they're asking me to do it for, for a lot of these people, right? I mean, and and so I I want I really empathize with. Well, you should never that. carry water for an abuser ever yeah. at all. But I mean, right? I just I just like the way that the way it's been dealt with institutionally, the church and stuff like that. I'm yeah. I'm pretty dissatisfied about it, right? Yeah. Um. As, as as you should be as one should be yeah and so that's why like 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 people you know um pe- people who like have been deterred right from uh joining the church or left the church over like i i i'm not saying they're right in terms of like their like rational understanding but i but i empathize with them I empathize with them. Right? Yeah, that's why I said it's understandable, yeah, it's even understandable. if I don't think that it's yeah. ultimately the, the yeah. most rational thing to do. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, and I mean, I remember I, I would like one of the worst sermons I ever heard was it was right after a recent round of scandals. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the, the claim was, is, you know, well, if someone left the church over this, they never understood what the church was in the first place. And, and that kind of like got me thinking, yeah, but what if. <laughs> Like, like, it's just an imprudent thing to say in that. It's an imprudent situation. thing to say, right. yeah. And like, like, I really hope there's not a victim in this room right now. And right. statistically, there's a good chance there is, right? Uh-huh. Do, do, you know what I mean? Maybe not, maybe not a good chance, but there's it's a non-negligible chance that there right. is. And moreover, it's like one of those things where we said, um, we've all we said at some point you have to say like there's a place where the rubber would hit the road, and you would say that this this thing has been like falsified, right? Yeah. Now the scandals right. aren't my rubber hits the road moment, okay? Mm-hmm. But I understand if they are for someone, right? Yeah, you, yeah. You, 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 so you that's I mean? that's yeah. important because I think yeah. we've we've been clear about this before that if you don't have some way of knowing that you're wrong, then your commitments count for jack squat, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Now again, but you have to make sure that what that line is for you. And I don't, you know, like sometimes there's there's issues of vagueness, right? Like a beard. Yeah. When exactly to have a beard? I don't know, but I know yeah. when it's there, right? Yeah. So. That, I think that's understandable. But for me, it's like, look, I mean, the Catholic worldview makes 
it makes a lot of predictions and it, and it also, um, there's also things that it doesn't predict, right? right? So if you're going to set some standards or some lines, they better be the relevant ones. So yeah, like for sure, if there's a VAT, I've said this a million times, if there's a Vatican three and the Catholic church renounces the Trinity, I would have to throw my hands up, right? And be like, that's it, right? That, that was the thing that you guys said would not happen, right? That is, that is part of the paradigm. But moral impeccability is not. And, you know, I'm somebody who spent a lot of time in the history of Christianity before I became Catholic. And that is both grotesque yet sobering. Right. Yep. I mean, even the sexual scandals, unfortunately, are nothing new. You go back yep. to the Renaissance yep. periods and it's it's sickening. It's sickening. Yep. Right. This yep. stuff mm-hmm. has been here yep. over and over again. Uh, most people forget about it. Fortunately, there is reformation. There is often cleaning house and. So all I can say about it is it's gross. It's sick. Um, it's not you. It's by no means unique uh, to any uh, religion or religious institution. It's something we should all be disgusted by. But at the end of the day, I'm going to stay firm in my commitment that, like, if you're on the like trying to evaluate a paradigm, the goal of the philosopher is to be cold and abstract in reasoning. Yep. Right. That is the goal of the philosopher. Mm-hmm. Yep. No, I, I I agree, but mm-hmm. I also think for those of us who have like remained in the church, I think a lot of a lot of them have just put their head in the ground, mm-hmm. like uh, you know, like a, like the ostrich thing, right? Oh yeah. Uh, in terms of the amount of damage that has been done by these scandals, right? yeah, right. And you can't just blame the Boston Globe for it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Because once again, like the, it, like the enemy, like it was made very easy for the enemies of the church. Right? Of course, yeah. Right. And and you right. know my my perspective here is that. Um, there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of garbage that needs to be taken out higher up, higher up, a lot of garbage. And I hope and I hope and pray uh, that we see that garbage taken out in our lifetime. Right. Not only just for the good of the church and for anybody who has suffered abuse, uh, but for them, too, because, you know, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic with Dante and the scriptural data that like, Look, man, you're higher up, and the more responsibility you have, the more evil you do, the the more hell you will ultimately pay. Right? Um, that seems that seems right to me. So, anyways, not to turn it into too much of a digression here, but uh, it's an no. Important... I think I think it's an important uh, digression, and, and I mean, it's not even just a digression, and and just and, and at least for me, at least being audience like honest to the audience about my relationship with the church. Right? You know what I mean? I'll admit, like this is. This still gets me burned, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So good question. Uh, Man, I wish we could end on a happier note, Jim. What do you have for us? Uh, What are you working on? Uh, I'm actually working this week on overtraining a jiu-jitsu. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah, yesterday I – there was just a – there are just a few kind of like hardcore dudes at the gym. And so we did uh 32 two minute rounds from bad positions and I never came out. Right. Yeah. And so yeah, it was like 64 <laughs> minutes. And it just one of like, one of the reasons I was trying to obtain a car for my teens, it seems that there's a, uh, an assembly of hitmen is convenient at the gym in about an hour here. So I think, I think I'm going to, I'm going to postpone my pressing workout to, uh, to tomorrow and probably go take a good good ass kicking this morning right yeah that's excellent i like that we're like both like texting and because we both have commitments we both have to run yeah, right yeah. now so yeah, yeah. so we're gonna yeah. have to we're gonna have to wrap this up we just we squeeze this one in early because it's just i guess a busy day for both of us here so yeah i have to go help my wife get eye drops on top of being pregnant and having very sore hips she just got pink eye of all things oh man uh, yeah. so yeah, uh, that's uh, that's always gross. <laughs> but uh, yep, gentle yep. listeners, uh, oh Jim, uh, mention your Gum Road stuff real quick. Yeah, I, I we put I put a link up to uh, the Flossy page mm-hmm. where um, uh, the good listener. It's under the Flossy people. I put a link up in in the comment section. We can put it in the description too. Um, to my Flossy page where they can go to my Gum Road page. Uh, eventually i'm gonna this weekend put a store page up on my website that are easier and once again like the nihilism course is there pay what you think it's it's worth to you i don't even care if you go free and then come back and give me a tip i have no problem doing this on a gratuity method you can't go wrong because i think i think when you when you do it when you see it you'll you'll say no that's worth something to me right so i have no problem if you go up there and say i'm gonna i'm gonna sample it for free and i'll come back and i'll give the good doctor a tip i have no problem with that at all also, probably next week, a short course on Heidegger's question concerning technology is going to go up, and that will be a uh, oh, awesome. visually driven PowerPoint 
uh, course, not not a formal lecture. So that that'll be coming up too. Awesome. I stole your method. I did the, I, yes, I, I, I have, I have gum road up. Uh, so yeah. we'll just, I'll, I, once I get back to my computer later, I'll just, I'll drop links to your courses and all the other stuff, uh, in the comments yeah. and people can check that yeah. out. So if you like what we're doing here at the channel, uh, please, uh, help us continue to grow by not just liking, sharing, subscribing, tell grandma what's happening at philosophy for the people, but support good professor, Dr. Jim. Uh, he's got this awesome pay what pay what you want. Uh, uh, access uh, to his his courses and his upcoming studies. So uh, yeah, thank the good doctor and uh, check that stuff out. We will catch you guys later. Peace.